Discord. To you. It's like your internet's pretty bad. Mine? No, Danny, your internet all of a sudden just dropped. Hello, welcome to Prophet's Chamber. Excited to be here tonight. We have a uh, exciting guest. I'm, um, I've actually heard of Phil for years. Uh, we've run in similar places, and but evidently we were across the room from each other in some of those events. And um, he's hung out quite a bit with John Paul and uh, some of the early vineyard stuff and just been around for a long time. He lives in northern Vermont, um, and I'm glad God called him up there and not me. Uh, it's, We're trying to pray you in, though. Oh, good. Well, it's not working so far. <laughs> but uh, no, actually, we're we're hoping to be there as well. But just really excited that he's here um, tonight and um, looking forward to all that God has for us. So, uh, But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Russ and let Re Russ do what Russ does. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, good to be back. It's great to always be part of these Prophets Chamber broadcasts. Uh, it's just, you know, I appreciate you giving me that opportunity, Danny. It's just a lot of fun. So, um, yes, Philip Saldati, thank you for coming and joining us tonight. I haven't had the pleasure or privilege of uh, meeting you in person, but now that we, we get to see you over the Internet, I guess that'll have to do. <laughs> so, well, I'm excited to be here with you all. Yeah, it's good. We have a lot of fun. So as you know, we tend to take these first few minutes out of uh, each broadcast to give folks a little background on you so they can get to know you a bit more. And so tell us a little bit about your background. How did you, you know, what was that? How did you get launched into this whole crazy world of the prophetic? You know, what was your, your first inkling that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm hearing God's voice. People ask me that and I tell them I kind of just like everything else. I just stumble into it, stumbled into it. Uh, I got saved at the tail end of what was called the Jesus People Revival on the West Coast of California, uh, late 70s. Um, my mom and dad got saved two years before me. Other friends of mine that I went to high school with and friends in the neighborhood were getting saved. John Wimber used to say it was so full of the Holy Spirit back then, the pastor could sneeze and people were running forward to get saved. <laughs> uh, and um, a friend of mine, Tim Story, who uh, was an evangelist, he had a home group and it was their mission to pray for friends that were not Christian yet. And I was on that list. And uh, he said he kept looking at that list and shaking his head thinking, I have faith for anybody to get saved, but not so sure about Phil. You know, I might have to pray harder. <laughs> well, long story short, I, I was deeply entrenched in the party world at that time. I dropped out of college. I went to college for wrestling uh, out of high school and wrestled for two years and then got bored and got into the party world and drugs and that whole scene. And, um, uh, everywhere I went. At that point, I had moved to uh, the Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach area, and uh, was living with some, some other friends of mine, and we had started some businesses on the side, and we were, we were dealing kilos of marijuana just for fun, just so we could have plenty on hand all the time, and uh, that's what we were doing. And everywhere I went, uh, these pubs, and I'd come out in the, you know, at like at two in the morning, there would be these Christians that were standing there waiting, like they're waiting for me. And they would tell me, uh, brother, you've got a call on your life. And they were just coming at me. Uh, I'd go surfing early in the morning. I'd be out there on the other side of the waves. Two people would paddle up on both sides of me and they'd look at me, just smile and said, you know what? You've got a call of God on your life. And it was a, it was a haunting time of my life. I'd go to sleep at night. <clears throat> and I would see these people talking to me and I just wanted to scream. <laughs> uh, 
long story short, I came home around Thanksgiving uh, one year and um, went out for a bicycle ride as I was uh, while I was visiting my parents and went to an intersection and a 17 year old girl ran a red light and hit me. Uh, had to have my knee drained. My wrist was broken. Hmm. Um, one month later, I came back to see my parents around Christmas time, just before Christmas. Cast was off, and a friend of mine asked me, "You want to go play some indoor racquetball?" I went and played some indoor racquetball with him about the fifth game in. Uh, it felt like somebody hit me in the back of my leg with the racket. I fell down, got up looked behind me and asked him, did you hit me with your racket? They, he said, no. He said, but I heard a loud noise. Hmm. And uh, long story short, I had completely ruptured my right Achilles tendon. Oh, wow. And uh, surgery the next day. Hmm. I was in the hospital during Christmas. Oh, wow. All my party friends, no one came to see me. <laughs> The only one that came walking in was Tim Story with a Bible in his hand, mm. smiled, realized he had a captive audience now. <laughs> That's awesome. And left me the Bible, prayed for me, prophesied to me. Uh, I told him I wanted him to leave. He left. And night after night, as I'm hearing Christmas music in the hospital, I'm all by myself. And I think I, I know God set it up that way. I had to take a good look at my own life. And at that point, I realized my whole life was spinning out of control. I didn't have insurance. I didn't know. How was I going to pay pay for this surgery and almost close to 10 days in the hospital? Hmm. And then I realized I'm going to have to move back home. And I left home at 18, turned around and looked at my mom and dad and said, you were never there for me my whole life. And I'm going to prove to you I don't ever need you again. And that's when I left home. Hmm. I felt I was putting myself through college and I was on a scholarship for wrestling at the time just before that. And, um, long story short, I had to go knocking on my parents' door. I'm on crutches and they opened the door and just smiled like they knew, Yeah. you know, and it was that telltale Christian smile. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, Oh my God, they got them too. Uh, and they said you can come home son wow and that was the beginning of a healing process especially between me and my dad my dad was retired army 82nd airborne world war ii and korean war mm. and uh there was no hugging there was no emotions in the home my whole upbringing and uh, one, one afternoon, he stopped me in the middle of the hallway, grabbed me by my shoulders, and he said, look at me. He said, look at me in the face. He said, I need you to forgive me for the way I raised you. And you need to forgive me for the pain I caused you hmm. and the lack of a father's hug, a lack of a father's love. Yeah. And uh, wow. so that, that was a big deal. Hmm. Wow. Um, but I kept partying. I kept doing drugs. Um, and I prayed one of those dangerous prayers one day as I went back into my bedroom and, uh, I had one hand on the telephone. I was ready to call a mental hospital to come get me because I thought I was going crazy because for the first time I had no control in my life. Hmm. No, what was I going to do? And I fell out of my chair onto the floor and I said, God, if you're real, you need to reveal yourself to me. But I said, not through my parents, I had a list, not through my parents. Every Christian I knew, I told them, you can't use any of them. So by the end of that list, I figured if he's really real, I just made it real hard on him because who's he gonna send? Well, the next day the phone rings, my mom comes out and says, Phil, the phone's for you. Went to the phone. It's a young lady on the other end of the phone. She said, hi, Phil, this is Margaret. Do you remember me? We went out two years ago. I said, yeah, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing great. You won't believe it. I gave my heart to Jesus. And she was going on and on. And I looked at my list and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> she says, and the crazy thing is, she said, I was getting to the bottom of one of my drawers. And there was a little slip of paper underneath some clothing. 
And she said, I opened it up and it was your name and phone number. And she says, the crazy thing is, I think I heard God say, call him. He's finally ready. Wow. <laughs> and she told me that on the phone, my knees buckled. And she said, we're going to a Christian concert at Calvary Chapel. And she said, would you like to go? I was a, at that point, I was afraid to say no. <laughs> I said, sure, I'll go with you. So she came with her girlfriend and we w went to Calvary Chapel. There was a band called Petra playing and a, a couple other bands. And Come on. I looked Petra. at her. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? You're talking oh. to two guys, Russ and I, who we, Petra, yeah. bring, right. bring them. Come yeah. on. <laughs> and as we're walking into this Calvary Chapel, I'm looking around and there's these big burly guys with leather vests on motorcycle club. I'm thinking, oh, this ain't so bad. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was all these people around that didn't look like, quote unquote, Christian. And so I thought, well, maybe it's going to be OK. Hmm. So, you know, I heard, you know, the, I like the music. How could you not like the music, even if you're not a Christian? Yeah. And uh, I heard the gospel preached for the first time. I didn't go forward for the altar call. But I heard what was said. Uh, they dropped me back off at my, my parents' house. I, there was nobody home. I walked in the front door, and it was as if this hot, wet, whatever, fell on top of me. Come on. My knees buckled. I bounced off one side of the hallway to the other and fell in the door of the bedroom. I kicked the door shut. It was such an intense moment. I had to grab a pillow, put it over my face. I just began screaming. I was trembling from head to toe. Just began wow. screaming at the top of my lungs. It was hmm. as if all this pain was leaving and fear and excitement all at the same time because I wasn't sure what it was. But it was right there on the bedroom floor Nobody there, but I gave my heart to the Lord right there on the bedroom floor. Obviously, the Holy Spirit led me through this, and it was it seemed like an eternity before I was able to actually get up off the floor. I, I, I actually couldn't walk. I crawled to the bed and pulled myself up on the bed hmm. and tried to go to sleep, but I couldn't go to sleep, and I just kept hearing this voice. Take all your bags of marijuana and flush them down the toilet. <laughs> that can't be God. <laughs> and I kept trying to ignore it, and it got more intense. Take every bag of weed and flush it down the toilet. Wow. And finally, after uh, it seemed like a half an hour or more, I finally said, all right, I will. And went and... Flush, you know, I kept thinking, I can't be God. I was fighting it, thinking, he gave us plants for our enjoyment. How can that be God? <laughs> part of his creation. Why would I, you know? so anyway, I fought it for as long as I could, and then finally <laughs> dumped everything down the to in the toilet, flushed it, and I went back, got back to the bed, and was actually able to fall right to sleep. I woke up the next morning, realized, because I was used to getting high first thing in the morning with a cup of coffee, go to bed. Same thing, smoke a joint before bed. So it was a lifestyle, at close to 10 years. Hmm. And woke up that next morning and realized I didn't want to get high anymore. I knew a miracle had happened and didn't quite know how to handle it. You know, with tears running down my face. I went out the front door, looked at the plants. I could actually smell flowers for the first time than I can remember and realized something, something powerful happened. And... Hmm. um my friend Tim Story and his sister uh, were driving down the road. They saw me out at the end of the driveway, and they slammed on the brakes, skidded to a stop, backed up the car, pulled into the cul-de-sac where I was, and looked at me. They rolled down the windows, looked at me, and said, what happened to you? <laughs> and I told them what happened. They jumped out of the car, and they were dancing in the middle of the street, <laughs> and, but realizing God did a miracle. That's all. Awesome. And... Uh, it was like three or four days later, uh, I, I was so captivated by the presence of the Holy Spirit. I mm. wanted to spend every uh, every minute I could that I had available just with God, talking to him like he was right there in the room. Right. You know, just childlike faith. Mm. I didn't know any different. Wow. And um, 
And that was what, like three days later, uh, I, I was in the den drinking some herb tea and talking to God. All of a sudden, I felt this presence intensify in the room. It was as if everything was shaking. I actually trembled onto the off the couch onto the floor, sensing this heavenly, only way I can describe it, a heavenly presence, as if every footstep I could feel getting closer. And I thought, he's either going to come here to kill me or deliver me even more. And I, I was looking for ways to get lower. The only thing else I could do was pull up the tiles off the floor and crawl underneath them. If I could have, I would have. That's how intense that presence was. And I, I, I was afraid to even turn my face to even look, but I could feel as if his feet were right next to my head. Mm -hmm. And I could hear him talking to me, calling me by name, Philip John, calls me Philip John, my, my middle name, Philip John Zaldari. He said, Philip John. And he went on to tell me why I went through what I went through as a young boy, what, why I went through what I did, and where he was going to take me in the future and led me through some scriptures, actually told me where to turn, showed me scriptures, and it coincided with my life and what he was doing. It was, it was, that's when I heard, I knew that I heard the audible voice of the Lord. It was either the Lord himself or it was one of his angels that he sent personally to me to give me a message and to give me some insight into the reality of, of the presence of the kingdom of God here on earth. And uh, so that was the beginnings of my journey when I heard the voice of the Lord for the first time. Mm. And uh, I, I, at that point, I figured everybody heard him like that. You know, I'd be getting ready to go to Bible study at Tim Story's house, and the Lord would tell me what he was going to teach on. He says, now tell Tim this. You know, he's going to teach on this, but tell him I want him to add this to his message. So when I'd show up, i say, hey, i pull Tim aside. i say, Tim, hey, I, I know you're teaching on, and I'll tell him what he was teaching on. His eyes would get real big, and I, and I said, but the Lord told me to add, for you to add this because there's people coming that need to hear this. And he said, he told you what? <laughs> I said, exactly what I told you. He's, you heard him tell you that? I said, well, yeah, I, I hear him every day. You do too, right? He says, not like that. <laughs> so that's when I knew it wasn't commonplace for everybody, but I thought everybody should be able to, but. Yeah. That, that was my beginnings of hearing the voice of the Lord and understanding his presence and valuing his presence because it was part of my birth. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. What a story. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, you know. I, so and then you, I went right into the vineyard at that point. <laughs> we still meeting in a high school gymnasium. Wow. And I was there right, right after the time when Lonnie Frisbee showed up. Oh, uh, that was an exciting time to be a part of something God was doing. Wow, I'll say that, that. That that was the beginnings of my walk with God. Mm. So to settle for anything less today, yeah, hard. I yeah. can't. I wow. remember what that was like, and I believe it's coming back, and it's going to be even greater. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's good. So in terms of your, your current ministry and the things that you're doing, is this still part of all of the, you know, the prophetic and all these amazing things? Are you still flowing in all of that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I was telling Danny at some point, because uh, I, I traveled with John Paul Jackson around the world for about seven years. Mm. Live, lived with him, traveled with him. Uh, I feel I, I inherited the gift to interpret dreams. Mm. Um, I mean, a local radio station here heard about me from somebody, a friend, and uh, told him, you need to meet this guy, Phil Zaldati. He's a life coach, but he's also, he knows how to interpret dreams. That really, they said, what? He knows how to what? <laughs> a radio station. Yeah. So they contacted me and wanted to interview me on the telephone off the air. And, and so uh, they interviewed me. And they, we talked about the life coaching and leadership stuff that I teach on. And then about 20 minutes in, they said, we love that and we want to bring that to the airwaves, but we also heard you know how to interpret dreams. Well, the main guy, Charlie Papillo, on this radio show, that's Charlie, Ernie, and Lisa radio show, radio talk show. Charlie said, I had a dream last night. He said, that's weird. Knowing I'm going to be talking to you, I had a dream 
last night about me and my son. Could I share it with you? <laughs> Long story short, he shares the dream. I give him insight into the dream and then prophesy to him non-religiously about his son and about him. And he's completely going ballistic on the other end of the phone. <laughs> we got to get you on the air. So <laughs> they put me on the air the following month for one hour. Their phone lines were so jammed. They've never seen anything like it. They said, would you consider having your show on our show once a month? Mm. So it's called the Coach's Corner with Phil Zaldati. So I teach, I share a little bit, some gold nuggets regarding leadership and coaching. Right. And about transition. I specialize in the area of transition. And then they open up the phone lines. And for 45 minutes, I take calls from people calling in, sharing dreams. And I interpret their dreams and then prophesy to them non-religiously. So I, I have that going <laughs> along with my coaching business for God sovereignly tied me into a group of men called the New Canaan Society out of New Canaan, Connecticut. These are guys that take the train into Manhattan every morning. They're mm. part of the financial world. I, I got connected to the founder and he opened doors. I coached him a little bit. He opened doors to others. Uh, so I am very much entrenched into the marketplace world. Nice. And uh, or I believe one of the next great moves of God is going to happen in the marketplace. Amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, well, my first, um, my fo first actual coaching client after I, I went to school out of Regent, Dr. Joseph Humidi out of Regent University, Virginia. I, you know, I can't believe this, Phil, because but, I went through his program as well back in 2009. So <laughs> no kidding. I kid you not. Yeah. I so, some, Joseph and I are good friends today and we're going to do, be awesome. doing things in the future together. Right. And we talk regularly and, He's been like a voice into my life, uh, yeah. coaching me and and prompting me, provoking me to dream bigger. Absolutely. And, settle. and um, <laughs> so uh, that very much involved with that. And my first coaching client, well, even before I got done with the one year professional course, yeah, um, my first client was a chairman of the Democratic Party for the state of Nevada. Wow. Uh, he He saw me at a at an event where I was speaking and contacted me. Long story short, his life went through such a transition. His wife would not allow me to get rid of him. They wanted to pay me double. She wanted to pay me double to keep her husband uh, uh, getting coached because she said, finally, I have my husband back. Finally, my two girls have their daddy back. Wow. And our home is completely different today. Mm. And uh, he, he, he could not stop you know, bragging about what's happened by getting connected to a coach like myself. Yeah. Able to interpret dreams for him and coach him and mm. help him transition from the world of politics into the business world. And mm. then he started opening doors in Hollywood. He started opening doors for me there in Las Vegas from casino owners. And uh, he <laughs> called me once from, from uh, Washington, D.C. He said, uh, Phil, I'm in a limousine here in Washington, D.C. Um, say hi to Joe. He said, uh, say hi to Joe, Phil. Um, uh, I'm in back seat here with Joe. And so I thought it was another friend of ours. And long story short, it ended up being Joe Biden, who uh, wow. had a dream two nights before. He was telling my friend uh, Paul Henry about it. He says, well, I have the perfect connection for you. Mm. And he went on telling him about me. And long story short, appointments were set up and uh, I ended up interpreting a dream for him and then coaching him through it for about a month. Nice. So all, you know, your, your gift will make room for you. That was a rude awakening for me. I, I was in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> like most, most, most Christians today think, Oh, I, I need to worship first for an hour. Then I can flow in the spirit. Well, guess oh, what? Man. The time yeah. has come where you got to be ready in an, in a moment. Sure. To be used Absolutely. By God. Yeah. <clears throat> That's so. awesome, man. That, you know, that's such an awesome testimony of, you know, and I, and I hope, you know, all of you that are watching this are encouraged to understand how God is opening doors in every aspect of society. And all we've got to do, as you say, Phil, is just absolutely be ready to move, ready to speak and know that, you know what, we are always ready. We're the ones that think that we're not, yeah. but yeah. we have the anointing, right? We have yeah. Holy Spirit. We're yeah. one with Christ. So yeah. it's really on us to recognize what God has done to make us available, yeah. make us ready. So I'm, I'm and, I'll tell, and I'll tell you why I went into when I started, why I started looking at coaching. I came home from a ministry trip 
and I, I believe it was in Europe, flew back home. I was exhausted, I sat down in front of my wife and she wanted to know how, how it went. And I just looked at her. And at that point, tears started running down my face and I told her, I can't do this anymore. Wow. She said, what do you mean? I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, for years now, I keep going back and forth to the same churches, same leadership. And I said, nothing's changed. Mm. They haven't grown. I, I pour myself out, lay hands on them till there's nobody left in the building. And then I come back and see them. They haven't changed. Yeah. They're still where they were the last time I was there. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I cannot do this anymore. Mm. And so that led me on a journey. In the middle of the night, that night, the Lord woke me up in a dream and said, son, where are the leaders that are willing to get off their platforms and walk with my kids so they discover the purpose that they, I created them for? Come on. <laughs> he said, where are the leaders that are willing to come off their platforms and walk with them? Mm. Yeah. Like Jesus did. Amen. He yeah. walked with those men for three years before he released them. Yeah. And when he did release them, they went and turned the world upside down. There you go. But who's willing to do that? Mm. Not many. Why? There's no money in it. Yeah, right. And the Lord told me, he said, my churches have created a welfare mentality where the people come, feed me, feed me, feed me, fix me, fix me, fix me. Give yes. me a word, give me a word, give me a word. Heal me, heal me, heal me. Hmm. Come he on. said they have not learned to get up on their own two feet, get on their knees wow. and learn how to, how to seek God themselves, how to mm. hear God for themselves, how to, how to hone and, 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 and sharpen their, their gifts, their skills, that and talents that God has given them and mm. grow up and become the leaders that they're supposed to become. Wow. Dude, you are preaching to this choir right here. Let me tell you, guys, I'm with you 100%. <laughs> Danny, I'm going to flip it back to you because uh, I think we're a bit over time on this one. But, uh, fine. Phil, it's been awesome, man. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, Phil, that's, that is uh, brilliant. I'm actually going to probably ask you a few more questions in a little bit. Um, sure. I really, man, I, I so concur. And actually, um, I think one of the greatest difficulties <clears throat> when, we, when we travel is going back to the same place and realizing, wow, no impact. Um, to yeah. me, to me, fruitfulness is absolutely everything of, that we're desirous of seeing. And, uh, that, yeah. you know, that was, that was the message of John. He said, I'm just excited. You guys are doing it. You know, it's like, come on, will yeah. somebody do it? So yeah. I, I really, man, I am, I am so with you on that. Well, I'm, I'm going to just take a, a, give you, give you about a, five minute break, seven minute break. And, um, okay. you can mute if you want, you don't have to, but, um, the, uh, I'm going to just share a few things that, that actually the Lord's been speaking to me just kind of in regards to what has been happening here. Actually, it's kind of neat cause you were there. Um, I don't know if you were there Saturday night. Were you there Saturday night? Um, in, um, um, Northfield mass. Yeah, who was, who was, who spoke that um, night? James Levesque. Yeah, I was there. Okay. Oh yeah. So, so let, let me, let me just kind of back up the story for, for you. There's, there's probably a few people who haven't heard this on here. I think I shared some of this the last time we were together. Um, but the, the word the Lord had given me way back um, in 82 was I saw a giant rising in a country church. And when he rose, it splintered the church. I mean, just it just decimated the church. There was nothing left of it. Huh. And Lord said, when I wake up my church, there's no structure on earth that will be able to contain it. And so that was, that was something way back then. But through the years, there were a number of points where the Lord would speak things. And at one point, I remember asking him, I said, Lord, how close will I be when this happened? I don't want to be overseas if it's going to wake up here in New England in, uh, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm gone. Yeah. I want to be close. And I... Um, I remember him, him showing me, he says, you're going to be, he, he's going to be four inches from your face. And I went, wow, that's kind of cool. So just moving on. And, and obviously I was a part of a lot of the, um, similar kind of stuff in, at least in the vineyard days where it was so, um, so powerful and, and, and refreshing. But beyond that, we, 
um, through the years, there were times that really waned and we didn't see the same stuff. There were a few meetings that happened that were pretty cool, but, but really nothing that carried that same um, sense of authority, power, God just yeah. showing up and it didn't matter who was talking. And so um, through that process, I remember that in the, um, when the Lord began showing me things about the mountain and showing me uh, the relationship between the mountain of the Lord and the kingdom of God, that they were basically one and the same, there was no difference. Um, I began processing, okay, so where is this major move going to happen? And the Lord actually gave me a word I'm going to share in just a minute. Back in 2015, um, the boys are back in town. Um, and you actually indicate oh, yeah. something on So I'm going to share something with that, kind of let you go from there if you want. But, um, but basically I, I had, uh, experienced some, some crazy things. I woke up at 622 on, um, Valentine's day, 2014, which was the same time that Bob Jones went to glory. Uh, when I woke up that morning, the Lord said, get ready. It's coming hard and fast. And, uh, when he said that I knew that um, there was something significant later on in the day I would find out that that Bob had actually passed away at the same time and I was like wow um, something's happening and then through the through the years the Lord would show me various things I had several dreams with Bob in it and um, just things the Lord was trying to indicate to me about what was coming uh, last um, probably eight, 10 months ago, I had a dream with Bob in it. And in that dream, I remember yelling at him saying, Bob, is it, is this it? Is this what's coming? And, um, is it coming? And I remember he did, he ignored me pretty much for the whole, the whole process until the very end. And just from his back, I just saw his head nod just very slightly. Well, in that I knew something's about ready to shift a year ago, the Lord had given, um, um, uh, a prophetic guy who's a part of our ministry here, a dream. And in the dream, he saw James Lebeck uh, as a starting pitcher for the 2017 Giants. And he said, I think it's significant to you. I don't know what that means. So that was in 2016. In 2012, Brian Simmons, actually in a meeting that we did down in, at, um, in New London at uh, James's church, um, Brian was there and Brian said, the awakening that's coming isn't going to happen really in the next year, two, or even three years. He says, but in the year 2017, I believe it's going to break. So those are two very strong wow. indicators to me. So anyway, so I, I came to that meeting. Honestly, that was the weekend we were supposed to move from our house. We, I, I had not planned on being um, in that meeting with James, but I love James. And so I just went pretty much to support him. And uh, we went that night and, you know, it was awesome. And, I remember I was recording off of my iPhone. Uh, it ran out um, and, you know, the, the battery finally died. I, I started recording only a song just to kind of, it was to tease people like, get over here. You want to see what's happening? Yeah. Good. But, but the Lord just said, keep going. This is historical. So kept recording, recorded my phone, literally battery died. The guy behind me hands me his phone. He just says, he didn't know me. He just says, keep going. And, um, and so I logged back into Facebook and I kept going. And for 20 minutes, um, it carried on and then it died again. And then it picked back up later on. Well, that 20 minutes was when James was on fire. Like I've never seen James on fire. And I've seen him many times. And it was, and it was where he was talking about footprinting uh, your forehead, you know, <laughs> not just stepping on your toes. And, but it was something where he was, it was a call. It was really a call to what God had called us to do here. Um, for several weeks at that point in time, I had a vision of, of a huge grate, kind of like a manhole cover, but it was about 30, 35 feet across. It was probably eight to 10, 12 inches thick and that it was going to require several to lift this thing up, but that this thing was coming off because the wells were opening, uh, right. that God was about to open the wells. And uh, he'd been giving us for about six months the word deluge. And deluge is not simply from up top. It's also from down under. And so I realized there's something significant happening. Well, that night he shared that. It was, it was amazing. I did not even put the dream on that thing. I didn't even think about it. 
But the next night when Chuck Pierce was there, I don't know if you were there for that. Yeah. But, but you know, the worship hit that place where nobody even knew what to do. It was and off the was, charts. Just, and in fact, before worship even began, I walked in that room and I went, whoa, the presence here is unbelievable. It was so thick. And I was like, Lord, you are up to something. And, um, and during that first part of the meeting, the Lord said, I told you, you would be four inches from its face. And I'm like, oh, what are we seeing tonight? And then Chuck gets up there and delivers a word that basically, short version, um, tonight's going to be remembered as the night that awakening began to take a nation. I went, what? And, um, and sat back down. And um, I honestly do not even remember his message that night. You know, that's, that's a crazy thing. Um, but the next night, Heidi ministered, there's fire, um, and people are getting saved in a Christian meeting. Um, yeah. From there, 50 miles south in Springfield, Mass., people are getting saved. Hundreds of people are on the streets with uh, Todd White, um, oh, yeah. Andy Bird, and, um, and Tom Rotolo, and, and hundreds are being saved, and, and um, evangelism is happening, but also healings are happening on the streets. From there, it continues on, and in Awaken the Dawn is happening in D.C., and the Lord speaks to me, and, and I have a vision, and I see a, a torch runner, and he's running, and he touches one, and ten are lit, and, and they run, and a thousand are lit, and they run, and you can't count it, and I'm like, Lord, this is, and he said, Danny, the nation is burning, and he said, this will burn, and I'm going to share something in just a second here. But basically, as a part of that, he showed me that, um, and in fact, that was when the California fires were burning. Uh, and it was like extreme, extremely extreme, uh, the, fire, the fires that were happening at that point in time in California. And so the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Danny, he said, he said the fire that has been set, he said, it, it is as Elijah's fire. And he began showing me uh, what Elijah's fire was. Very interesting, the association of Elijah and fire, because it happens through his ministry. There's fire. Um, not, not only does he call fire down from heaven uh, without any ranting, without any hype, without any, you know, it's, it's very, it's, you know, I, I've seen this and I've seen, you know, the, the um, the prophets who are going oh god oh god and I'm going yeah it looks like the prophets of Baal prophets of Astra that's exactly what they were doing Elijah goes send your Lord show them who you are and the reality of that simplicity of relationship that he had that he understood understood the significance that God was going to move fire falls it is a vaporizing fire. It is not something that you would find in Africa or anywhere else because no. it would take two days to burn one cow. And, um, and so it's not just the cow. It is the altar. It is the water. It is everything that's been burned. And as a result, there is this, um, obviously, uh, the Lord, he is God. There is, there is a turning. The fire created the turning. The fire created a whole generation to recognize who was absolutely in control. And so to me, fire is, is significance. What Jesus says, he says, I have wanted to come and bring a fire. How I wish it were already kindled. I wish it had been started. With Elijah, it begins there. It continues on. Actually, I believe, and I don't know your, your theology on Elijah, but the Lord many years ago, for two years, he had me re reading in 2 Kings 2. Um, every time I'd go, he'd say, yeah, go to 2 Kings. I, Lord, I know this passage over and over. I'm like, can we have something fresh? And I had a, a prophetic guy down in, um, in the Charlotte area come up to me, and he goes, um, I have a word for you. The Lord says you'll receive it because of 2 Kings 2. This is after two years. I'm like, I'm listening. So he gives me the word. But in that process, you begin realize, I began realizing that, that Elijah was a prophet who actually gave up. He, he, he literally, at the end, he, he never anointed the two kings he was supposed to anoint. Um, he, uh, and he ends up his days outside the promise, not inside the promise. And the only two who ended up outside the promise were Moses and Elijah, the two who would be restored at, at the Mount of Transfiguration. But nevertheless, he kind of just like, let me find my replacement so I can get out of here. And so when I see that, 
uh, and then and then when the soldiers the soldiers come to him, the king of Samaria I think it's Samaria at that point. The king of Samaria uh, wants to see you. He goes, uh, "Oh man of God!" He goes, "If I'm a man of God, may fire come down and and toast you." And it does twice. The third group managed to figure out how to get through without getting toasted. And, uh, but fire was associated with Elijah in a huge way. Later on, when he crosses the river, it is it is a chariot of fire and chariots of horses uh, yeah. that are on fire. So literally fire was so much a part of what it was that he did. I believe that actually it relates to the um, to the Malachi passage where it says that I'm going to turn the hearts of the father to the sons, hearts of sons to the fathers, um, or else there'll be a curse. I believe fire will be a key part that the that the sons want to see the fathers functioning in what they said god once spoke to them yes. that they and they will follow and they will there will be a relationship tied the sons will will say to the fathers you are who i thought you were and this and the fathers will say to the sons come this is your inheritance too and i believe there's going to be a, a whole relationship in regarding that whole that whole realm Going forward, when I, um, uh, so I believe that there was something significant that broke on October 1st in 2017 that I believe has begun something. And the Lord spoke something to me. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of it. I kind of shared it right, right then. But Elijah, um, the Elijah fire, the Lord says, this is going to be like Elijah's fire. Well, Elijah's fire cannot be quenched. Water has no effect on this fire. That they're in, and one of the biggest things that I've noticed with certain kinds of moves, there's been moves and then it's been quenched. It's been stopped. But what I saw happening was the Lord says, no, this one is going to, it's going to increase and increase and increase. He said, there's nothing going to stop this. This is going to be a major fire on the earth. Um, but then uh, a few years ago, the Lord spoke to me and he talked to me about the boy. He said, the boys are back in town. And um, we all know the song. I'm sure you know the song. Um, but, um, but what I did is I, I, saw, I saw mist blowing into the city and across the countryside. And it went and it began looking into caves and pulling people out who had been there. And, and there was a DNA in this wind. And this DNA was saying, I'm calling you back. It's time now. It's time now. Come back. Come back. Come back. And, um, and, there, and then it, it woke up the ancient purpose in people and their destiny. Words, dreams, and revelation spoken many years before um, began to to live. Um, one of the keys that I believe to what's about to happen is we're about to see a prophetic company that has been buried, hidden, and could give a rip about anything happening because they said, way too much fluff. I don't give a rip about this stuff. I want to see the real legitimate God. When that happens, I'll come out of my cave and maybe listen. And they've been buried. They've been hidden. And the Lord, the Lord spoke to me. There was a pause in this vision that I had. And he said, the boys are back in town. And, I, I, and the presence just came over me and went, who, Lord? And he, and he began showing me pictures and people that I knew from years ago who, who were moving in incredible power who were just missing. It's like, where are they? They're, you know, they're just, they're gone. And the Lord, the Lord showed me that when they come back, there's going to be an exponential increase of both presence and power and authority. One of the things the Lord spoke to me a number of years ago is he said, do you want the baby back? We had an encounter where a baby was being presented at one of our conferences um, by a, a heavenly creature. And um, it's in, we have photos of it. It's crazy. And, um, and when that was happening, the Lord spoke to us and he said, do you want the baby back? I said, Lord, what's the baby? He said, it's authority. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's authority. He said, do you remember when John would be in places? And I remember I was in Ashland, Ohio in one particular, and I, most of the folks here have heard this, but, but for your sake, um, I remember that there were two guys that were there basically to uh, take notes to, to refute John and, and his belief system. And, um, and after the session, uh, right, right as he was going into some ministry things, they got up. It was a linoleum floor in a cafeteria at, um, at a, a Catholic university in Ashland. And um, 
before they hit the back door, they fell down. One fell forward, one fell backwards. Yeah. And they're banging their heads as hard as they can on the floor, yelling at the top of their lungs. What he's saying is true. What he's saying is right. Right. What he's saying is true. What he's saying is right. And they couldn't stop. They're yelling it. And, um, and he said, do you remember that, Danny? I said, I do. In fact, I actually called a couple of buddies who were there, Ken Fish and some others. I said, did this really happen? Am I making this up? You know, they said, yeah, we, this is really what happened. And I'm like, that's crazy, you know, <laughs> that, that would happen. But there was that authority that was on John that was unbelievable. It was, it was unparalleled during that era. And I remember that, I mean, people would be frozen, stuck, couldn't speak, couldn't just all kind. And the Lord says, that is coming back to the church. He yes. said, I'm about to give back that baby because authority is going to, is going to be what, what will take it through the places where people will fall back as it did with Jesus, where they, where they, they will not be able to push this thing over a cliff that, that literally that, that authority is going to step in. And, and that's what he was saying on the boys. He said, the ones that, that you knew and the ones that are coming, he said, they're going to move in an authority that's going to be, very significant. Uh, he sh- he, at, in that process, he said, um, they are like sleeper cells and they're uh, about to come to the, to the reason that I created them for. So and that's a very short version of it, but I, I'll post that on, on the chat here uh, yeah, for awesome. to look at again. But I just really, um, I believe, Phil, and in fact, hearing your heart, even at uh, Northfield, um, I was just like, man, I, I, I love your heart. I, I, I love both the history you've carried, but also the fact that you are reaching forward into, into things that um, they're unfamiliar territory, but um, it's full of faith. It's full of the fire. It's exactly what we got in for to keep going further into the, into the stuff of, of, of the kingdom, the stuff of, of what God's called us to. And it's in many different facets, many different fields. And the fact that you're functioning in the marketplace fields, I know that some others will be really excited here. I know that uh, Will has got to be really excited about that. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I'm going to go ahead and flip it back over to you. And I just, I really, I really appreciate uh, what you were sharing. Even your testimony was awesome. I don't, I've never heard that. I mean, that's the abbreviated that. version. What's uh, yeah, but it was crazy. It's great, man. It was, <laughs> and um, you know, and, and just to give you kind of a, a sense of, of where folks are at, there are, uh, we've talked about way gone days with Lonnie. Um, they obviously know stuff with John. We've talked about um, John Paul. We've talked about Paul Kane. We've talked about Bob Jones. Um, most of most most of the significant prophetic voices through the through the past thirty years. So I um, just to kind of give you a, a sense of, of where you need to go. Uh, just feel free uh, to to just take us where where you're sensing the Lord's. Oh, thank you. Right you bet. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it, you know, people ask, how did you get to where you're at today? And I tell them, again, I just kind of stumbled into it, did my best to try and, and follow God where God was leading me. When he told me to leave John Paul, I mean, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do was to go into his office and to tell him that it was time for me to leave. Because he had poured seven years of his life into me, thinking possibly I was going to be the one to take it once he left. Wow. Uh, but, I, you know, towards the end of the sixth year, every night I was having dreams of when I first got saved. And John Wimber, his thing was get them saved, get them back on the streets as quick as possible before they can get religious. You Come know? on. <laughs> and, uh, and he even, you know, when he was feeling burnt out and, and, uh, and was getting angry with people and angry at the church, he knew it was time to get on a plane. He flew to Atlanta and spent a week at Glenfire sleeping on a cot with all the homeless people. By the time the week was up, he said he felt refreshed and reset, and he was ready, ready to launch in again. And so ministry to the poor, ministry on the streets uh, was a big part of my early life, and I kept having dreams about all of this and feeling and sensing God was telling me that he didn't call me just to the platforms to point people out and prophesy, but he, he wanted me back on the streets also. So that, that, was, that led me into what became prophetic evangelism, we were looking for places to exercise our gift outside the church because what God was doing with us there it was so precious. We thought, how can we keep this inside the church? We got to get it out to the streets. 
So that led us on a journey to go into the co coffee shops and start interpreting dreams for people. Pretty soon, the whole coffee shop was around our table. Like, could we have a chance to awesome. sit down with you? And uh, young kids would walk out. They would wait for us outside of Borders Bookstore. Who are you people? Where did you come from? And because uh, their, their hearts were laid bare. They were sharing a dream and it spoke about their destiny. And pretty soon we interpret the dream, give them the piece of paper as we showed them how we interpreted it. Then we, our, our pattern was interpret the dream, give them the piece of paper with all the notes on it, and then look them right in the eyes and say, do you mind if I tell you a few more things that I see when I look at you? They never said no. Come and then on. we would just go on with words of knowledge and prophecy about their future, what they went through and where God was going to take them. And they would be in tears and just stunned. So that's where I, I went. And, and that's where I, I had to tell John Paul and you know tell him, thank you. He saved my life more times than I could count. He believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And I am here today because of him being like a father and an older brother to me. And uh, you know, I'll forever miss him. I'm on the, I'm on the board of directors now for, for streams to help them in this transition period but I'll forever miss that man. I'll always, I'll forever miss John Wimber, but he poured into my life as well. But, um, you know, going into coaching and, and realizing God was taking me into a different, down a different path. And this has been the hardest time of my life. Uh, you know, it's never been easy, but that's the path that God led me in. Uh, not knowing what the future held. There were no models to show me what prophetic evangelism looked like. Nobody else was doing it. My friend Steve and I were the pioneers. Yeah. And uh, then taking it into the marketplace. Now I'm, I'm interpreting dreams for guys from Goldman Sachs and from all these financial institutions. Um, you know, if they knew I was a college dropout and a drug addict, they probably wouldn't want to hear me anymore. <laughs> now they're, you know, I, they're coaching and I'm coaching them and I'm in giving them advice for their life, for their future. And you know, I, I always come out of those sessions turn off my computer and go st stand and face the wall and say, I can't believe I'm doing this. You know, here's these guys that are, you know, financial gurus and I'm advising them on their lives. You know, that's it's crazy. It's yeah. absolutely crazy, but that's where I'm at. And I believe God has people just like myself uh, that are in this place now, not, not sure what the future holds, but knowing they can't go back to what used to be. So I call this being stuck in the crucible between who we have been and who we can become. Yeah. God is always taking us through transition seasons where something has to end so something new could begin to be formed. And so I believe there's many like myself that, and some of you that are listening right now, God has you in that place today. And he wants you to know, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. He's got you in his hands and he's going to bring you through the whole process. You're not alone through this whole thing. He also wants you to know what, um, what got you here is not going to get you there. There are more tools. There are more things that God is going to put in your tool belt to get you to where you need to go. And many of you have been operating in your prophetic gifting as you've known how to operate in it. But then you realize this isn't working out the way I thought it was going to work out. And here's the prophetic word. And I shared this at, at my, my uh, workshop at, at, at Northfield. But this is a prophetic word that the Lord gave me. And uh, shockingly, it comes from about the prophet Elijah. Oh, wow. That's awesome. First Kings 17, where he goes and he prophesies to Ahab about a, um, a drought coming. There'd be no more rain in the land. And here, he'd already been operating as a prophet. God tells him, now go prophesy to Ahab. He gets in front of this man, and I'm sure it was scary knowing who, who he was married to, to give a word like that. It was a hard word. He gives the word to this man, and then the Lord tells him, now go hide yourself by the brook Kareth, and I, I'll send ravens to you to feed you night, you know, in, in the morning, then again at night. There's a brook. You can drink from the brook. And then he didn't hear the Lord anymore after that. How many of us have obeyed the Lord? And then we wake up and we're, we're out in the wilderness now. We're operating on our gift. Now we can't even hear the Father anymore. Come on. The Lord hadn't spoke to him anymore. 
Yeah. And he's sitting by the brook and the ravens are dropping a slab of meat in his lap at night. And then again in the morning, he's thinking, probably thinking, oh my gosh, I walked away for this. And he's watching the brook and slowly it's beginning to dry up. I looked at, uh, I looked up, did a little research on Kareth, Kareth Ravine. Kareth means a cut, cutting, a cut off place, a place of removal, cut off from all human aid or help. This is where Elijah found himself. He's been cut off now. And also, it's Kareth also means a place of whittling. You take a branch off a tree and take a knife to it and start carving it up. Guess what? You're changing the shape of it. God has cut us off, many of us out, and isolated us to be alone with him while he reshapes us for the coming days. It's a painful process, but that's what God is doing in his servants today. He's reshaping us, reforming us, giving us a new sense of core values for our lives, for our, our ministry, and for our businesses. He's re-envisioning us. It's an ending. The first stage of all transitions begins with endings. And Elijah's life, as he knew it before, has begun to change. He's not going to go back to what it used to be. God had something fresh and new for him for the future, but he had to spend this time in the wilderness. The second stage of transition is the wilderness phase, which in the original Hebrew also means sanctuary. It's not meant to be a place of punishment, but it's meant to be a place of communion with the Heavenly Father, where you're hearing his voice in a fresh new way. And as John Wimber always used to say, until you've heard him as an intimate friend and lover, you've not heard the voice of the Lord. And we'll hear that voice of an intimate lover in this time of being in the wilderness, being cut off, a place of removal uh, where, where man can't help you, but only the Father can help you. Yeah. Or he's reshaping us. Um, so he sent him, sent Elijah to the Kareth Ravine. He sent him to a season of divine isolation for the purpose of reshaping or reforming and reshaping his identity. How many of you have ever gotten up in the morning, looked in the mirror and wondered, who is that? Yeah. I thought I knew who I was, but things are rapidly changing. So it was a place of protection and also a place of supernatural provision. So God's servants are learning all about God's supernatural provision in this season as well. Either he comes through or he doesn't. But he's going to show himself as the Lord our God, our provider. He's never failed, and he's not going to fail you through this, through this season uh, also. Uh, and this is a place of dreams, where God is wanting to re- uh, restore that gift of dreams again into our lives where we're having dreams again. Let me give you an interpretation about dreams. Your dreams are the product of your longings, portrait of your potential, and a promise of your future. Let me say that again. Your dreams are the product of your longings, portrait of your potential, and a promise of your future. As a side note, keep that in mind because of someone also famous in the Bible that had a dream about his future. So we're going through these phases of transition. Elijah's going through these phases of transition as well. The brook dries up. How many know God will allow things that we think are strengths in our lives, he'll allow them to dry up in our lives so we don't lean on them, so we don't depend on them, so we ultimately depend on him for everything. That's what God was teaching Elijah uh, in this time as well. So when the brook dries up, what does he tell him? Now go get yourself over to Zarephath. I I've, uh, have a widow there that's going to take care of you. Zarephath was the land of his enemies. What would you have done if you heard a voice telling you to go to the land of your enemies? I would have said, I come against that in Jesus' name. <laughs> If you look up the name Zarephath, it also means smelting furnace. Wow. Or a refiner's fire. He went from the frying pan to the oven, the broiler. And for a man in his position to depend on a widow to take care of you, that was not good either. He was ultimately dependent on a widow for his survival. 
So he, um, and this, uh, just let me word it, word it this way, so I don't have a lot of time, but he goes into the widow's home. She's in a crisis. She thinks she's making the last meal for her and her son that they're, they're going to die. A crisis. He's in this widow's home. God brings all of his servants, and he's bringing you and I through this as well. I call this God's finishing school, called the test of the home life. The test of the home life. There's a crisis in that home. He doesn't get fearful. He's exhausted. He doesn't get angry with her. Like, where's your faith, lady? No, he takes compassion on her and he prophesies right into her crisis. And God provides a miracle for her and her son and for Elijah. The quality of your life is the quality of your communication. How well we listen to our kids, how well we listen to our spouse, how well we listen to our boss, how well we listen to the relationships God has entrusted into around us, how well we listen to them is usually a direct reflection of how well we listen to the Father. Yeah. Also, communication with those around us but also communication with yourself. What are you allowing your mind to ponder on and entertain that you've heard? I heard this in a blues song. Careful what you, careful, um, uh, how does it go? Uh, careful what you're saying to yourself, you just might be listening. So what are you repeating that you've heard or that you've been meditating on that maybe is not from the Father. Our inner world is a direct reflection of our outer world. We want our outer world to change, our inner world has to change. And that means taking the advice of what the Father told Joshua of how he would become successful by meditating on his word day and night. He says it'll make your way successful. So pondering on what the Father is saying not on what the culture and the world is saying uh, is, is key for this, this season. So good. And a, 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 a capstone, so to speak, a, a foundation that we're learning in the test of the home life is what I call in the coaching world, it's, it's emotional intelligence. And here is one of the major cornerstones of the foundation of emotional intelligence, and it's this. Seek first to understand before demanding to be understood. It'll help you in your marriage. It'll help you in dealing with your kids. It'll help you dealing with the public people. Seek first to understand before demanding to be understood. And also spiritual intelligence. We'll learn this as well. Here's a definition of, of spiritual intelligence. It's the ability to behave with compassion and wisdom while maintaining an inner and outer peace regardless of the circumstances. An inner and outer peace. If you look at the life of Jesus, he was a perfect model of that. When they wanted to take his life, when he was being tested by the Pharisees, trying to entrap him with circumstances, with the prostitute, or on and on and on, he never panicked, but he had an inner peace mm. that everybody could feel outside as well. And he would hear the father how to respond in those situations. Elijah modeled it in the crisis there in the widow's home. Um, and then when the, the widow's son dies and Elijah did not panic, he said, give me your son. Took him to the upper room where he was staying, laid out the little boy on his bed, lays himself over the little boy three times, cries out to the father and the father raises him from the dead. Symbolic of laying down his life on behalf of the next generation. This is key for us. It's not all about us, but we're called to cause a shift to happen in the culture, and we're called to create a door for the next generation to run through that we've created because we've been obedient and walked with the Father and carried out exactly what he called us to do. That's what God is doing with this generation of, of prophetic people. He's not gonna release all these loose cannons anymore. 
He's going to raise up a generation of them prophetic ambassadors like Elijah, like Elisha, like Daniel, like Joseph, like Esther, that yeah. are going to be ambassadors of the kingdom out in the marketplace as well as in the body of Christ. They're going to be brand ambassadors of this brand called the kingdom of God, both in how they communicate and how they present themselves. God will be able to tap one of you on the shoulder and say, I want you, I'm going to send you to the White House. Somebody's going to be calling you and you're going to represent me on behalf of the kingdom of God. And you're going to com communicate well to them what mm -hmm. I want them to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or into the financial world or out in, you know, and starting a small business, but being a brand ambassador of the kingdom of God and how you run that business and how you present Jesus in you to the public and to the world. So this is what God was doing with the prophet Elijah in this woman's home. Little did he know what was waiting for him around the corner was Mount Carmel. Yeah. The grand stage, a global stage of all time to represent the kingdom of God and his heavenly father and to show the world who the true and living God was and what a true prophet was and to, to model the prophet of fire for all the world to see and to topple all the false gods and the false prophets and expose them as the odds that they are. You and I are going to do that out in the culture outside, but he's had to work overtime preparing us and hide in hiddenness. And he wants to know, are you valuing this time of being him hiding you for a season? Yeah. It's not been easy but it's been crucial for what's coming. Does that make sense? Yeah. Very good. Let me share this also with you, with what uh, the Lord showed me the enemy's been doing. All while all of this is going on, because it's been hard for many to go through all of this, but the enemy at the same time has been sending smoke screens. I call them smoke screens out to you. Smoke screens, and I, I, wrote, I made notes of this. It's the enemy making it look like you have lost in certain battles that you have been fighting. Distractions or smoke screens leading to quote unquote fear. Fear regarding sickness, financial situations, family situations, Doors opening or closing that you've been believing God for. The enemy's been sending distractions or smoke screens to try and tell you you've lost the battle. The Lord wants you to know you've not lost the battle. The enemy will try to threaten you. Now listen to this very closely. These threats may be coming from the giants guarding the territory you are about to invade. Come on. Threats of pain or disappointment. But the enemy wants you to see it for what it is. These are distractions. These are smoke screens to try and get you to walk away. But it's just the enemy doing what he knows to do. But he want, the Lord wants you to know it's a time for persevering faith. Time to lock shields with others until every promise from God is fulfilled that he's told you. And a key scripture for this, Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Press in and pray. And here, here's some key words for many of you. These, what you've been waiting for, these are hidden breakthroughs. Your breakthrough is already underway, but God has kept it hidden. He has, isn't hiding it from you. He's hiding it for you to protect what he's doing so the enemy does not get in and abort the breakthrough that, that, that you've been waiting for, call, crying out for, and fighting for. Hidden breakthroughs. Your breakthrough is already underway. Yeah. And these are not single doors that are opening for you. The Lord wants you to know for this year, double doors, double doors into nations, government, media, marketplace. 
Again, to remind you, we are stuck in the crucible between who we can become and who we have been. I want to exhort you with this, do not settle. I'll give you a word my personal coach gave me a number of years back. He said, Phil, you have the life you've settled for. I got angry at him at first. What do you mean? He said, are you happy with where you're at? I said, no. Why are you settling for it? You can change it. The reality is we are co-creators with our Heavenly Father. We've been created in His image. His presence is in us. How did it all start with our Heavenly Father? Creation. You and your Heavenly Father are to walk this journey as co-creators. What is that dream inside of you? What is that passion inside of you that's still waiting to, to be manifest? Your purpose, your purpose that you're created for never changes, but the assignments, those foundational assignments leading to it will change. Just as it did for Joseph. Does that make sense? Yeah. The favor of God is on you, but favor lies dormant as it did with Joseph until that favor is sown into the soil of someone else's need. And what is that someone else's need for you? He has a place that he wants to send you and that favor will lay dormant until that favor is sown into the soil of someone else's need. Wow. What is that assignment he's called you to? What is the ultimate purpose that he's created you for where your favor will literally explode? The closer the proximity you get to where God has called you, the more your gifts will begin to flow. Come on. Like it did for this, this man that was buying biotech companies that had gone bankrupt. He called me one day and he said, Phil, I didn't understand. I go to church every Sunday and I pray for the sick and no one's getting healed. He said, what's wrong with my healing gift? I said, Joe, tell, tell me again what you do. I knew what he did. I just wanted him to, to verbalize it. He said, well, I buy biotech companies and I restore them to financial uh, success. And then I take them public and make a lot of money. I said, there you go. That's your healing gift, Joe. You're called to the marketplace to do marketplace miracles to give glory to God. What is, where is your gift going to come alive? Everyone waits for Sunday morning, but what are you doing the rest of the week? Your favor lays dormant until it's sown into the soil of someone else's need. Favor makes you effective. Favor made Joseph effective. Joseph modeled this, this coat of many colors to show everybody how much favor he had with his father. What good was that coat until, until it was changed into service of some kind? And you and I are called to serve. Everyone wants to lead. How many are ready to serve? Everything comes alive when you have a heart to serve. And Joseph was called to serve. That God said, there's so much favor on this boy, Joseph, I'm going to make him a slave. Then I'm going to sell him to Potiphar. Everywhere he went, he went lower, which mm. sent him higher. Mm. God takes us like he did Elijah, humbles him for a season, takes him lower, but then does even more miracles through him in the process of all of this. God was shaping a servant that he was going to show the world, look at my son. Look at what he did with Joseph. And then, yeah, favor, favor, for favor to come alive, it's got to, it's got to go into that area of service, just as it did with Joseph. Um, he was promoted again and again. What happened to him as he's in prison? He learns commodities. He's learning all about grain, how to harvest it, how to store it, how to get it ready for time of famine. He was learning commodities. He learned about cattle. He's in the prison. He's over all the prisoners. Guess what? He's learning communication skills, leadership skills in the midst of that, that culture that God had him in. He didn't become bitter. But he learned those skills all along the way that were preparing him to lead a nation and to influence the leaders of his time. 
in a, in a, in a different culture called Egypt. Then when it came time for him to go before Pharaoh, what does he do? He shaves off his beard, gets his haircut, cleans himself up, and puts on the clothes of an Egyptian. I glance well now said the ultimate display of emotional intelligence. Of, he knew he had to connect with these leaders. So he changed his appearance, changed his identity somewhat, and then goes before these leaders and operates in his, his prophetic gift just as he did in the prison. The favor has pain. What did God do? God yanked him away from his family. Imagine all those years probably wondering, will I ever see my dad again? My dad was the only one that loved me. Will I ever see my brothers again? Wonder where is my family? Are they still alive? He unlocks dreams for men in prison and then they forget about him. How many times have you, God used you to unlock people's dreams and then they're gone? And you're wondering, am I, am I even making a difference? Imagine what Joseph must have thought. You know, where's my joy? God, maybe, maybe, maybe my joy is theirs. Maybe this is all I'm going to amount to. Be forgotten, taken advantage of, betrayed. Favor has pain to it, but God and his grace helps us to not become bitter in the process. And then what does God do? Much to Joseph's su surprise, in walk his brothers. And scripture says, when he saw his brothers, he began screaming so loud and sobbing so loud they could hear him all the way down the hall. I believe it was God's way of showing him and reminding him, Joseph, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. In fact, I'm going to restore what the locusts have eaten in the canker worm. I'm going to restore all that you have lost and all that the enemy has taken from you. I want to say that to everyone listening. This journey has not been for nothing. Nothing's been wasted. In fact, all the, those tears that you've shed in the middle of the night, pleading with God and calling out to him, the pain and the frustration, and the disappointment you've walked through. God, God's got you right where he wants you. And he is going to bring shame in the camp of the enemy and bring great joy to your heart as he begins to restore everything the enemy has taken from you. And he's going to reward you for walking this journey with him as he has isolated you, but protected you, provided for you, and has been equipping you, putting new tools in your tool belt to get you, to prepare you for a global stage, to prepare you to go back into the culture of this world and be a change agent for him to transform the culture out there for the kingdom of God. This makes sense, everybody? Yes. It does. I think everybody else is muted, but wow, man. Yeah. Very good. I'd be happy to answer any questions or how do you want to follow up with this? Well, I, I want to share one thing. I, yes. Yeah. Somebody just wrote, uh, they're weeping. I'm weeping. I'm like, <laughs> this is, it's rocking me. It's really good stuff. I want to share, you know, there's something you said a little while ago um, that your breakthrough is hidden. And a story actually came came to my mind when when that happened. Um, I went from California. Um, I was in California. I was working with gangs there, and uh, I was there when Keith Green had his. He passed away in '82, and um, I was actually at the second to last conference he or a concert he had. But I remember that the the Smalley family went to go visit him um, in Texas and they were actually on the way to the East coast to plant a vineyard. Um, and um, Keith took them up in the plane and they died. I mean, the, yeah. the plane crashed. And um, the next thing that happened was that several months later, another group um, of people were going East to go plant another vineyard. And in Colorado, 
um, there was a fiery accident and um, I think a couple of them died and the guy who was leading the team was burned I, I, so bad that he, he, John, when John talked to him, he just said, I just want to go home. I'm in too much pain. And he right. ended up passing away as well. And John just talked about the warfare and the stuff that, that comes as a result of uh, pressing into what God has called us to do. And, yeah. uh, uh, and I remember that. And, and I remember that during that period of time in my life, there was something that the Lord had spoken some things to me, but then there were, in, there were events that happened in my life that actually brought me to a place where I was so low. I was so discouraged. I was, and, um, and I ended up crawling back um, to South Carolina, uh, where I'd been called to plant a church. And, um, but at that point in time, I was in no condition to plant a church because I was just a wreck. I was, I was a mess. And, um, and the Lord said, he said, I snuck you here. I snuck you through the enemy lines. He's been killing people who've been trying to come to the East Coast. And wow. he said, that's how I got you here. When you said that about the, the, um, that your breakthrough is hidden, I believe for many people, some of the very circumstances they're in that seem the opposite of what, of what's going on in there, uh, of what God has called them to are in fact, God hiding them, uh, that the breakthrough will happen. There were so many things you said. I mean, I was, I was typing away. I, I actually never type on this, but I, I was typing just so many things that, that you spoke and I'm sure there's many more things that others wrote down as well. But, um, yeah, who, who else has a question? Let's, let's just see what you got. Just raise your hand if you can. Um, I think there's a way to raise your hand, but I think it's down in, um, who do we have? I know God is delivering a number of individuals. Naomi, from fear. Yeah. If you've Go been ahead, struggling Naomi. with fears. You're on. Me? Naomi. Oh, Naomi. Oh, we can't hear you. Your mic is not working. Oh, well. Type your question. We'll get to it. And uh, is there anybody else who had their hand up? All right. Go ahead. What were you, what were you saying? Because many of you are, are called to be those that are carrying this measure of favor on your life. That favor is meant to, to help you be, uh, to shift things. Everywhere you go, things shift. Transition just gets started uh, in groups and people's lives. Wherever God sends you, a shift begins to happen. And pioneering something is hard. You don't, you, there's no models to look at. There's no books written on it. And let me just tell you this, that I've learned through the coaching process. The pathway to your greatest potential is through your greatest fear. Come on. The pathway to your greatest potential is through your greatest fear. And behind every fear is a person you've always wanted to be. So allow God to walk you through those fears, whatever they are. Fear of man, fear of failure, fear of whatever it is. God is going to walk you through it and slay it so the enemy can't come back with it later. Or you'll know your father, whom the Lord sets free, is free indeed. Amen. So, Phil, Naomi's question was earlier you said that your prophecy in an, uh, you prophesy in a non-religious way. What do you mean by that, and can you give an example? I'll just say what John Wimber used to say, because uh, he used to hear people prophesying, and he'd say, Ladies and gentlemen, you've been in church way too long. He says, you need to get out there so you learn how to talk to the lost without sounding like you're talking in another language. Jesus always spoke matter-of-factly. He didn't yeah. say, yea, verily, I say to thee. Uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> he just said, take up your cloak and walk. Come on. Uh, 
and so I, I had to learn uh, by going to psychic fairs and other other arenas like that to learn how to talk just matter of factly uh, as God was speaking to me to be so for people to understand. You know, there's another teacher out there that I, I, I got to know a number of years ago and heard him teach at some of these New Canaan retreats. His name is Tim Keller. Uh, he said it took him at least three years to learn the language of Manhattan. You know, and, and talking to all these businessmen, in fact, I, I just uh, helped lead uh, um, one of their retreats a few a couple weeks ago. Uh, these men's financial, I mean, uh, marketplace men's groups have formed you want to know what the, one of the number one reasons is? No. Pastors don't know how to talk their language. Yeah. It's church language. Yeah. Religious language. That how do you talk to a, a you know, a, a businessman? Most everything is kind of a lot of fluff to it. Or as John Paul used to say, a lot of hamburger helper. Yeah. God, God doesn't need that. No. We can just. Talk as if you know, talk like you're out in the marketplace, like talking to some carpenters or some construction workers. You aren't going to talk in all that fluffy Christianese lingo. Come on. So it's just learning to, to speak the language of the streets, but yet not violate the word of God, but just talk so people can hear you and understand what you're saying. Yeah. You, know, you won't go up to a businessman and say, I see a huge mantle on you. Yeah. <laughs> What's he going to say? <laughs> Get it off. <laughs> That's right. I don't what is that? Me near me. <laughs> I would tell him instead of a mantle, I'd say, you've, I, I see an incredible gift mix on your life that you, that's going to cause you to be incredibly influential and impactful wherever you go. He'll say, what? Tell me more about that. I'll tell yeah. him what I see and what I sense. You know, instead of saying, I see a glow around you, you know, acting all mystical out there. I say, what in the world? That's so good. Instead of, instead of saying, I, I see incredible charisma and, and gifting in your life that tell me what you do. I said, I just sense it. I can feel it when I get around you. Tell me about yourself. Yeah. People want to talk about their, what they got. Yeah. They're prideful. Yeah. They want to share. <laughs> Tell yeah. me what you do. So I, I you know, it, you just learn, learn to talk like you would out in the street. Yep. That's, that's really good. I was with somebody just a couple of days ago and, and uh, we were in the hospital praying for somebody and uh, it was pretty obvious that the one didn't know the Lord at all. Um, but the Lord had given me something for them and they immediately just warmed up to the whole thing uh, because it was, um, and in fact, it, their, their word was completely filled with swear words and everything else, you know, their sentence thing. And it was like, uh, because they're, they're just responding to the fact that you saw something that God wanted to do in their lives. And yeah. it's, real, it's real to them. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and I used to, uh, when we would go and do a, a prophetic school at uh, Blood and Fire in Atlanta, I, I would fly in three days early just so I could hang out with the homeless guys. Yeah. You know, and, and just listen to them. And they, you know, they'd pull me aside again and again and tell me, you know, we love all the food here and all that. But they said, what means more to us than anything is, would you be willing to listen to my story and just spend some time talking? Yeah. That tells them you care. Exactly. You know what? And people can smell a religious spirit a mile away. Yeah. You know, once they sense that, you might as well pack your bag and come back another day because they aren't going to hear a word you said. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Um, I have another question here for you. Yeah. What is your favorite way of developing intimacy with the Lord? I'm uh, somebody's listening. They can't. They can't get on, but they're on the phone. Something like that. You know, uh, just spending time listening to the voice of my Father, just getting away from religious people, getting away just to spend some quiet time with him, listening to him, reading his word and just meditating on it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I told you we had just had Mark V come and uh, the impactful part of what he brings for his workshops is you break up into small groups, but you alone, you pick a certain scripture and you put your name in it 
and you rewrite it a little bit to make it personal to you. And then in your small group, you're reading that word, that scripture with your name in it, of the Father talking to you personally. I'm telling you, the anointing is so heavy on that. He brought that to the New Canaan Society retreat, and I've never seen so many type A personality businessmen sobbing like little boys where they can't even get through that scripture because it's a scripture with their name in it, with the Father talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. So they're reading it to everybody, the, the other three people in their group, and then somebody's taking it from him and then looking him in the eyes and reading it right to him as if it's the Father himself giving him that word. So I, I want to encourage you with, all with that. Find scriptures that you, love, that you really love that speak to you, but put your name in it personally. And in your quiet time, read it to yourself as if the Father himself is talking to you. So that intimacy with the Father is so key uh, for everything in the future. Yeah. And um, it, there's, no, there's no shortcuts. You've got to spend time with him. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, I'm just going to give you these questions. You answer what you want to. Um, what does it mean to coach someone through a dream? And then there's another one that says, um, what ways have you stretched your faith in the prophetic? Well, that one with some, that individual in the limousine that stretched me that morning, I'll tell you that much. That was pre-coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coaching somebody through, through a, a dream. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a recent one because uh, I'm on this secular radio station every month. In fact, I'll be on there tomorrow morning. But um, uh, on one of the mornings, a ex-military guy calls in who was a, an Iraq war veteran and uh, was telling me about a, a dream he had, has had. I think it was going on three years. Every single night he has this dream where it's literal torment where he's waking up out of it with sweat coming down his face. He's trembling in fear. And uh, it got so bad a couple years ago that he actually went to the doctors and they put him on medication and the dreams continued. And it, he was a uh, dreaded have, knowing nighttime was coming and it was getting close to time for him to try to sleep. Well, uh, I had him uh, share that dream live on the radio. And then I, told him a little bit about lucid dreaming where you're used to your dream language and you're used to the type of dreams that you have or you can actually get involved in the dream and change the outcome from negative to positive. So I taught him uh, about that and then in the in this tormenting dream this something this ghoulish huge ghoulish a uh, beast would be chasing him. And I, I told him at a certain point, you need to turn around and face this thing. I said, because the issues you run from run to you. The fears you run from will run to you. So long story short, he called me two days later and he did what I coached him to do. He turned around and faced off this ghoulish beast. And once this beast knew he wasn't going to run anymore, it got scared and ran the other way. Well, well the first time in uh, three years, this post-traumatic post stress disorder uh, just intensified from his war, war experience, but it, it was rooted in his childhood. And I coached him through that. I call it unpacking from your past so you can get on with your future. And his abuse, emotional abuse and verbal abuse uh, that he endured as a little boy set him up for the enemy just really bombarded him from the stress that he faced in this uh, and some of the worst Middle East war in Iraq and uh, caused this thing to intensify. Uh, but he, I, I coached him through how to how to turn that deep dream around and it worked. He faced his fear. Then I coached him on what were those fears that took root as a little boy and helped him unpack that. And long story short, he's a Christian today and wow. is serving the Lord. 
but it was through him being able to share this dream, feeling safe enough to share the dream, number one, and then willing to have someone come alongside him and help him understand what he was going through that ended up being rooted in his childhood. So you never know. You never know. That is so good. So that's coaching someone through a dream. I love that. Uh, yeah. I, I love, I'm loving your language. It's, it, it's helping me rethink some things. I like it. Good. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. I've, uh, I've actually often talked about the fact that mm, we, we know the fact that God gives languages, foreign languages and stuff like that to people. That's what happened in Acts. But I've told people many times, I said, are you kidding? I said, there's so many languages. I said, you have to, have, you have to know the language of speaking to, um, and in the church setting, you have to know the language of speaking to Catholics, speaking to evangelicals, speaking to whatever, but yeah. you have to know the language of speaking to business people. You have to know the language of speaking to, whether that be construction workers or white collar or yeah. bankers. Those are all different languages. Every oh, yeah. Language. Oh, yeah. It's all different. Yeah. You know, and a lot of these businessmen, uh, these type A personalities that I was telling you about, I had to learn their language and the way they think. Yeah. We have a word for these type A personalities. We call them the Attila the Hun types. Yeah. Their, their lifestyle is to conquer. Yeah. Conquer and win, you know, in business. Yeah. And life. And, uh, but their emotional intelligence usually is bottomed out. They have horrible communication skills with their spouse. Almost every single one of them that I've coached, it starts out coaching them with their, their business world, but within one month or two, I'm inside their home, so to speak, in the coaching process, and I'm asking them about their marriage, and usually it's hanging by a thread. They, yeah. They've become workaholics because things have gotten so bad at home, but it's usually their, their lack of empathy for their spouse, learning how to communicate well, uh, and bonding with their children. It's, it's something they just don't know how to do. And they have to be coached through that whole process. It's just uh, unbelievable. That's so good. So good. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, I got Alan. one. Hey, Phil. Who's this? Uh, Alan Garrett. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, hi, Alan. Yeah, how's it going? Good, good. to see you. Good to um, see you. It's been years. Uh, yeah, it has been. It's been a while. I have a little gray in my beard now, huh? <laughs> look at my hair. I traveled yeah. with John Paul. This is the you result. Look, you look very uh, white. Yeah. Um, it's the Moses look. Uh, uh, oh, Maria, here's Maria. Al. Hi. Hi. Good uh, to see you. It's been, it's been probably, what, 20 years or something? Yeah. Yeah, over 20 years. Anyway, um, my, here's my question. Uh, what do you say to guys that, like, I'm, I, I often get prophetic words. Almost every time I pray for somebody, I'll get meetings, I'll get words, but I don't seem to dream much. I get, I remember maybe one, two dreams a year. And for some reason, that whole realm is just, it's not open up to me. I don't remember my dreams. I barely ever remember them. And is it just the way I'm wired or is, I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, uh, John Paul used to say, well, you know, number one, you gotta pray. Pray and ask God to help you remember them. Uh, Number two, uh, let, let, let this, so to speak, the word of God be the last thing that goes into your system before you go to bed. Uh, and uh, I have people all the time that tell me I don't dream. And uh, I, I remind them of what medical doctors, actual med medical doctors say that if you did not dream, you would literally go insane. Yeah. Everybody dreams, but some dream early in their sleep cycles some dream later in their sleep cycles. So, you know, if it's towards the end of their sleep cycles, it's easier to remember at that point. But so I've, I've had to pray and ask God, help me to remember my dreams, Lord, give them to me later in my sleep cycle. If you, you know, if you want me to remember them. Uh, sometimes we dream, but like a letter, it gets sealed by the Lord. It'll be reopened at another point, another time. Oftentimes those dreams are like Joseph's dream or it was about, it was a destiny dream about his future, but it, look how long it took him to walk into the reality of that dream. So sometimes God seals it and reopens it at another point, another time. But that seed of greatness, that seed of destiny has been sown into your spirit. Why does God do that at night? Do you ever wonder about that? No. 
<laughs> because if he gave it to us during the day, we'd probably argue with him about it. <laughs> That's probably true. Make it happen. I, and my friend Steve used to say, Phil, how come God gives me so many dreams? Uh, and I said, I don't know. Why don't you ask him? He said, hey, that's a good idea. So he, he prayed and asked the Lord, Lord, why do you give me so many dreams? The next morning we're having coffee. I said, what did the Lord tell you, Steve? He said, the Lord told me that's the only time he can get in a word edgewise. Wow. Yeah. That's good. Hey, uh, um, Oftentimes it's like a seed that gets sown into our spirit. And it begins to grow and he begins to water it with his word and with his promises for for something greater down the road that is going to blossom and bloom. But very often it's hidden from us, uh, hidden for us by the Lord, so we don't interrupt and mess up what he's doing in our lives. Because remember, we're called to be co-creators with him as he shows us, gives us vision of what he's doing, and we're partnering with him and speaking those things that we see into existence or what we believe is getting ready to come, we begin calling it forth, speaking it with the spiritual decrees uh, as, as we're walking hand in hand with the Lord through the process. That's good. Co-creators. Hey, yeah. Ra Rachel has a, has a question for you as well. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. So I guess it's kind of a question. So all I do is dream. Like if I take a, 10 minute nap i have a full-on dream if i have several dreams every single night and you remember all them. throughout the time i go to sleep i remember them all wow could you pray for us all later <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome that's awesome and what was your question i'm sorry well i mean does that happen to you too N no uh <laughs> I am I am dreaming more lately than I ever have ever since uh, Northfield Danny actually yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I do dream and usually the ones that I do remember I I wake up with the sense of the Holy Spirit all over me and I realize uh oh this one is is important and I, I I journal most all of them but I really make sure you know at those points that I really take note of what God spoke to me and ask him even to show me again what he showed me in that dream because usually it's not just for me but it's for for others as well but journaling them is so important and dating them and um and getting interpretation for them and remember this john paul taught me this and taught many others uh that we're usually the worst at interpreting our own dreams because we have a built-in bias to begin with yeah and so it's always good to share with somebody that's gifted in that area or has some some wisdom in that area that can give you some feedback regarding those dreams. Uh, uh, so you, you can get some good feedback from trusted uh, brothers or sisters that can help you with the interpretation process. But they do need to be interpreted. And an uninterpreted dream is like a, a, a gift that's not been opened. Mm. That's, so, good. that's awesome. You've got a strong prophetic gift in your life. Uh, I sense a seer's gift mm -hmm. in you too. You see in the spirit quite a bit. But you have that potential. Has anyone ever told you that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Good. So I, I she see was it in Northfield too. <laughs> Pardon? She was in Northfield. Oh, good. Okay, good. She lives in South Carolina or, yeah, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah you've got an amazing anoint anointing on your life. Yeah. Or how would I say that to the lost? In Columbia. You've got some amazing gifting in you that's waiting to, to be to blossom um and I, I just sense this from many of you i don't know tell me if i'm wrong uh but here here's what i find with a lot of individuals and uh potential unexpressed equals pain and i sense there's a lot of heartache and many that are on this tonight because you know there's more in you and more about you that is waiting to be expressed that has been shut down, uh, maybe by the culture that you've been walking in, I don't know, but there's more and you know there's more and, and uh, God wants to, to release grace, Come on. blessing on you tonight to, to help you with that. Um, 
if you let if you let the church world define you you're going to be in a lot of pain if you let the culture out there define your values and who you are you're going to be in a lot of pain you've got to allow the lord and his holy spirit to def help you define who who you are and who you're created to be not the world not the church and uh, uh, please understand me when I say this, even family. I can't tell you how many young men I've gotten phone calls from uh, that are in the financial world. They went to Yale or Harvard or Princeton. Uh, they've got a young family, a baby at home, and newly married, uh, and they are in the worst depression anyone could ever be in because they hate what they're doing. Yeah. And they don't know how to get out uh, because of the pressure that's all around them. But it was family that pressured them to walk out what they did and now they're miserable. Yeah. God has a, has a plan for you, Jeremiah 29, a purpose and a plan and a design to help you get there. It just takes being able to see and tap into that design that heaven already has laid out for you to walk through and walk in to get to the ultimate purpose that he created you for. Yeah. Remember there are assignments, foundational assignments leading to that purpose. But again, you can't sit and wait for it to fall on your lap. You've got to walk with your heavenly father through the process and he will lead you that direction that he's called you to. Wow. You know, you know, Phil, it's, it's actually very unique because, I mean, we've had a bunch of folks on here. But what I'm sensing on you has been very unique. Um, uh, and I guess it, um, John Paul's effect and impact on your life um, just became rather significant to me because I was, I was actually at Blood and Fire. John Paul was there. He was a special speaker. It was a Friday noon. I was going through hell. <laughs> no. The worst time in my life, you know. I, I, and I, I don't say that. It was really bad. And um, I was pastoring at that point in time, but I was just having a hard time. And he, during that meeting, you know, that was in the days where everybody was like, oh, man, give me a word, give me a word. Everybody wanted a word. And so people are taking off work for this noon hour. Um, time with John Paul. Yeah. And he, um, he spoke for 18 minutes. He ministered to two guys from Blood and Fire. And that's all he did. And oh. people were angry. I'll never forget it. But the word that he had was one of the most amazing words. Because he said, um, he, he said, when Jesus gets in the boat, immediately you'll be at the other side. And that was basically his message. Um, a little longer than that, because it was 18 minutes. But he kept looking at me during that message, and then he would just keep speaking to everybody. And he'd keep looking at me and to speak to everybody. Well, you know, he gives these two words to individuals that were just a couple of the guys who were part of the ministry there. I, I mean, off the streets guys. And, uh -huh. um, and that's that was it. That's all he gave, you know. And everybody had taken off their entire lunch break and the rest of the oh. day, you know. And so they're all upset. Well, the next day, I um, they had a pastor's thing with John Paul up at the Vineyard in in Atlanta, and um, I went up to him. I said, "Man, I said if that word was for anybody, I said it was for me. That was an amazing word." And he said, "Actually, Danny, he said that word was for you," and he said, oh. "The Lord told me I had to give it to you that way." And so I literally went back down to Blood and Fire and I said, you know that tape that you've got, that 18? <laughs> and I said, uh, can you make me a copy? He said, nobody wants it. They were all angry. He says, you can have it. So I got, <laughs> I got the master and everything. But, but the whole time you've been talking tonight, Phil, it has, it has felt, I, I have felt, I felt like so much has been spoken directly to me. Hmm. And, and the crazy thing is I think everybody who's on tonight is really feeling that they're each being spoken to individually. 
Wow. And that, is, that is a phenomenal, I, that, that is an incredible release of the prophetic on our lives. And uh, I just, uh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful you've been with us. It's been. I'm grateful that you invited me. Man. Um, I don't know if anybody else feels the same way, but I, I see a few people nodding their heads, but I just, um, uh, not that we didn't have you, but that they they were feeling kind of pinholed as well, you know, or pigeonholed. Like, <laughs> he's reading my mail. It was really good. Really good. Excellent. Well, I've had to, and I'm still walking through all of this personally. The Lord never lets me share anything I have not already been walking in and through and experiencing through that process myself yeah. before he lets me open my mouth. That's awesome. I love it. Well, if there's anything else you have. Yeah, uh, I wanted to share uh, just this co-creator piece again. Okay. And this is from uh, a wonderful man by the name of Erwin McManus. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He has a church called Mosaic yep. in Los yep. Angeles. Yep. And uh, someone by the name of, and you'll recognize her name, she put this, wrote this and sent it to a, a particular uh media outlet. Her name's Maria Shriver. She yeah. read the book and was so taken by it. Uh, she, she put this together, but let me read this to you. It's just, it's short. Uh, I just picked a, a, this small piece here. It says here, uh, many of us enjoy the benefit of living in a world someone else imagined. In a sense, we are all living inside of someone's imagination. We find ourselves powerless when the world or our life is not what we imagined. We are most alive when we are living out our dreams. At the same time, the world, the world we imagine demands our input, our deepest and most powerful dreams will not allow themselves to be ignored. To do so, we soon discover it comes at a great cost. We do not live well when we live beneath those dreams. We ignore, to ignore them is to awaken a phantom that will haunt us both when we sleep and while we are awake. We have been given a gift, the ability to dream. We've been given a curse, the ability to dream. Mm. The dream is meant to be the beginning, not the end. The dream is our hope for our future, our dream of love, our dream for significance, our dream of sobriety, our dream for a better world, our dream of success, our dream for a better us. When we imagine but do not create, we are left with an overwhelming sense of dissatisfaction. When we imagine a better world and do not risk to create it, we find no fulfillment in our success. When we imagine ourselves as better or different than we are, but do not change, we are in danger of despair and hopelessness. Humans must create not only to express ourselves, but to find ourselves. Yeah. Does that make sense? It, uh, yeah, it's amazing. And let me uh, end with, uh, I call this uh, the Lion Manifesto. It's from a book by Mark Batterson called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. Ah. What a title, huh? Yeah. Here it is. I hope uh, this blesses you all and encourages you. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Set God-sized goals. Pursue God-ordained passions. Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Keep asking questions. Keep making mistakes. Keep seeking God. Stop pointing out problems and become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past. And start creating the future. Stop playing it safe. Start taking risks. Expand your horizons. Accumulate experiences. Enjoy the journey. Find every excuse you can to celebrate everything you can. Live like today is the first day and last day of your life. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Burn sinful bridges, blaze new trails, criticize by creating, worry less about what people think and more about what God thinks. 
Don't try to be who you're not. Be yourself. Laugh at yourself. Don't let fear dictate your decisions. Take a flying leap of faith and chase the lion. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, um, thank you. So, so grateful. We'll definitely want to have you back sooner than later. That was really, that was rich. Oh, good. Rich. I, 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 I like growing and not just hearing. That's really good. That's good. Amen. That's some stuff I'm going to have to process through myself. <laughs> oh, well. Well, <laughs> and any of you that are on this here tonight, if uh, you have more questions or uh, need help with anything that I, I shared, uh, I love to take responsibility for anything I share and help uh, explain it further or take it a little deeper. I, I'd be happy to help out any way I can. That's awesome. Do you have a website we can throw up here? Or uh, It's my business one at prolificleadershipsolutions.com. Prolific? Prolificleadershipsolutions.com. There's a new one coming uh, because of this new venture that I have been yeah. invited on to called Transformation TV. I'm going to have my own TV show on their platform based out of London airing early next year and a book coming out called The Extreme Journey. Uh, and I didn't get that idea from Danny. Um, <laughs> had no idea. I think it's great. It's great. <laughs> my, my, my book's going to be called the, uh, the extreme journey, navigating from your dream to divine purpose. Very cool. Uh, and, uh, my show is going to be called, uh, the extreme journey. It gives me a lot of leeway, whatever direction I want to go with the episodes and that type of thing. So good. Uh, it's a non, non-Christian platform, uh, where I'm going to be bringing, kingdom principles into the darkness to bring more light. So Amen. it's going to be fun. So good. Yeah. Well, bless you, Phil. I'll be in touch with you in just a minute um, via text or something. But Okay. Bless God you. Bless you all. I'm going to break these guys out in the groups. And Thank you. Great. All right. God bless you all. Oh. Thank you Thank very you. much. Very much. And here you go. You do have to join your room. You can't just sit there um, and expect to be moved. You've got to do something on your end as well. Some of these groups have been going seriously late. The Spirit of God really moving. It's been incredible. So. Um, Oops. Hello, How did I get in here? Um. What do you want? Cannot hear you. Send up a smoke signal or something. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay, I'm trying to find everybody. I'm like, where's everybody? Danny, are you on here? Uh, he, I don't think he wanted to be here, so he was trying to get out. Okay. 
There's five people here, but let me see if I do it this way. Yeah, no, but you know, Danny wasn't expecting to be in here. More. Don't raise hand. I can't see everybody. What is going on? Eric was here, but he's gone. Oh, is he? He was. Huh. No, I'm here. You guys can't hear me, though, right? No, we I can hear, hear you now. I don't see you. Why can't I see Loretta, Eric, and me? I'm using the Zoom app, but the video hasn't been able to work, and I couldn't hear anything, so I hit switch to audio, and then so I could at least hear 